intersessional due to the coronavirus. Uh, we couldn't have this intersessional at the uh, PwC Experience Center in Zurich. So we are here now together with David from Humans Capital um, to discuss the topic building crypto and blockchain ecosystems or how to build them. So you can see we have Günther from PwC with us. We have Fred from PwC with us. Um, and on top, we have um, David from Yeoman's Capital. And I would say we just start with the conversation. Um, and yeah, then afterwards, uh, all the people that are looking at our live stream are invited. And we really ask you also to, to if you have questions, uh, that you ask them. And uh, we will then include them. Uh, and I'll give it to David. So um, I would start with one or two basic questions, David, just to start the conversation. And afterwards, Fred and Günther, um, you just come in with your question. And then, of course, also the audience, as I said, can, can ask questions. So first of all, um, David, I mean, you're known from the Silicon Valley also that you build uh, their ecosystems in the financial, in the traditional financial world. Um, and now you're focusing more on the blockchain crypto world. So from your point of view, what is what is the most important thing um, if, if you're building an ecosystem? It's a really general question, but I think we can build on that and afterwards. Sure. Yeah, happy to talk about that. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, had an office for a while, at plug and play one of the largest accelerators in the world. Um, and also a lot of time in Austin and sort of seen that ecosystem uh, get bootstrapped the last uh, 10 years. And one of the things I would emphasize is you have to lower barriers for entrepreneurs. And this has a direct effect on the number of entrepreneurs that you have in your ecosystem. Uh, so, for example, you know, it's, it's not enough just to have friendly laws. Switzerland has done an amazing job of setting a very friendly regulatory uh, and legal environment, but you then have to go and reduce the cost and make it very simple for people to know how to set up in Switzerland, how to launch their startup, how to get all the partners, investors, and mentors that they need. Um, and so I put out uh, an article recently about first, why it's time to go to Crypto Valley, and then more importantly, how to launch in Crypto Valley. And that got a lot of traction. And what I really did is I went to all the experts in Switzerland and I tried to pull in their advice about where are the law firms, where are the investors, where are all those resources. Um, so just for today, last night, I launched a new website, uh, CryptoValleyStartups.com. And we can start to put together all of the resources that this community has and people can be added as editors. This is all hosted on Medium. So I want to build a library of resources for startups so they know where to live, how to get going. As much as we can reduce that barrier, you can go from an engineer who would have gone to a corporate job instead to starting a startup, right? And if we can make it 10 times easier by handing them all the resources, you can get a commiserate 10 times increase in the number of entrepreneurs. So we've, we've got everything set. We have the legal and regulatory ecosystem that we've already seen 800 crypto and blockchain companies emerge in Crypto Valley. And now I think if we want to build on that and create sort of the world's largest by far uh, tech ecosystem in this next wave of internet, we just have to continue lowering those, those barriers. Um, and the second thing that I would say is embracing failure. This is one of the real keys of Silicon Valley. Nobody is afraid to fail. Nobody is afraid to fail. They know that they can build a company and give it a try. And if it doesn't work, they can try again. Right? I always loved when I was growing up uh, the quote from uh, Thomas Edison. And somebody asked him, you know, how did you keep, you know, trying to invent the light bulb when you failed so many times? He said, I didn't fail. I found out another way it couldn't be done, right? And he famously went through 2,000 iterations to create the modern light bulb, right? And it took that type of persistence and a view that if every startup were gaining knowledge about one way 
that it could have been done. And you, you build institutional knowledge of how to build startups, right? It's, it's a very rare skill because people try to build a, a startup and you know if they're sort of discouraged by the community and it doesn't work out, they'll just go back to corporate, right? And you don't get that institutional knowledge, everything they learned from the first attempt. And so if you look at Silicon Valley, they put a premium on people who have built companies before, even if those companies weren't successful. Because the last investor paid for all the lessons that that entrepreneur got. So I think that is a key cultural point that we have to take. So there's the practical things of, of giving the resources. And then there's the cultural thing of embracing failure as a part of the creative process. So those are the two biggest things that I, I would emphasize. And, and coming in to Crypto Valley, I want to sort of push those, those cultural points uh, as much as I can and build up the resources that are available to entrepreneurs. Okay, so if, if we talk about Silicon Valley also, I mean, the, the lesson that you take, the more like being forward looking and maybe also fail. So are there also other like lessons that you could like implement or that you would like to have from Silicon Valley? Because I mean, that's, that's how you build an ecosystem and maybe to add that. And also we discussed it also with Fred before the call, comparing Wyoming, for, for example, that they're having their way to do it and then maybe Crypto Valley. So what is the difference there? What we, can we take out from the good things from both sides? Sure. No, that's that's a great question. You know, and in the U.S., Wyoming's by far the furthest along, as far as a friendly jurisdiction that has very clear regulations. They've done a great job of passing legislation. Uh, credit to Caitlin Long and all the people who have been advocating for that over the years. Um, but they have challenges in that there isn't a large city there. Uh, Cheyenne is the largest city in Wyoming. It's fairly small. Uh, it's a few hours from Denver, so you could make the argument it's part of that ecosystem. But, you know, it's very difficult to get people to move to a place that doesn't have sort of all the existing ecosystem. And Zug and Crypto Valley and the greater Zurich area, really everything from, you know, Liechtenstein and, and the rest of Switzerland has very unique network effects. You already have a major financial center. Right, that you can tap into that's literally 20 minutes on the train away. I mean, from the American's perspective, that's like you know, an easy daily commute, like no big, no big deal. You drive an hour, it's, it's, it's no problem, right? And so you know, tapping into those network effects is the key. So if you look at Silicon Valley, what did they have? They had big universities, Stanford and others. They had large research groups like Stanford Research Institute. Um, that helped with large government research projects long before the age of the internet that built up a body of thousands and thousands of engineers and PhDs and, and the people that would go on to build Intel and then from that spin into you know, the modern web and, and personal computer. And so I think we have to do similar is, is there's unique DNA in Crypto Valley around bearer assets, around wealth management, around finance that we can leverage. You know, um, that's, I think the key is, is to focus on where we already have those strengths and then plug in this new technology. You know, it's not surprising to me that the same place that the world found is the best place in the world for bear assets is now the best place in the world for crypto assets, concerning crypto assets effectively are a bear asset, right? Whoever holds the private key holds the value. Right, very much uh, a good analogy to, to gold and, and traditional bearer assets. So we have to focus on the things we already have, build on those network effects, and take advantage. There are huge tech campuses in Zurich. There's huge you know, universities, uh, ETH and others, that have a, a base of engineers. We just got to continue building on those network effects. Um, that's, that's really what you want to do. You want to you want to go with the traction. You want to go with the network. So think about where Switzerland and Crypto Valley are strongest and continue to build on those tracks just with this new tech. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I, I open now the discussion also to Fred and Günther and also, of course, to the audience that we have. So I think these are like the basics that I just want to, to set the stage. Um, Fred and Günther, from your side, I think um, with your experience also. I mean, happy to take it from here. First of all, really happy to, to be with you all. Thank you for, for joining. It's uh, a bit of a unique format, but uh, I think it's also uh, the start of something we hopefully can do uh, more often. Um, also, obviously, I would have liked to be in one room with all of you guys, but uh, we'll do this a little later. So I think, um, David, you made some, some really good comments uh, in terms of what creates and drives an ecosystem. Now, what brought me to the, to the blockchain world was, was really this concept of decentralization, which is mm -hmm. something I've been very passionate about for many, many years, even before I knew the, knew the very term. It was more that in, in Switzerland we call it subsidiarity and so forth. And, and I fundamentally believe, as everybody who knows me, uh, will, will attest that I believe that decentralization and the move to circular economy models uh, are the two things that, that we need to, to save this planet, uh, because most of the problems we have have to do with centralization. So uh, a lot of the things you touched upon that's still about real regional kind of ecosystem. And we're very happy sitting right here in the middle of the crypto valley and all of that. But obviously, uh, blockchain as the underlying technology is decentralized. So we need to create uh, a global ecosystem. So I think the broader question, which, um, which Nicola also um, provided for, for today's session, is how can we magnify that? How we, can we make it bigger? And, and if I understood you correctly, you basically say the drivers uh, you need are, on the one hand, a favorable regulatory and legal environment. And with that, I would like to stress, I'm not talking about uh, light touch regulation. That is not what brought people to Switzerland. It was predictability and reliability of rules uh, and a very credible regulator uh, who has standing in the world. Right? So those who wanted to build sustainably, uh, they were seeking that because that gave them comfort. Secondly, we're talking about a uh, critical mass of talent, if I'm paraphrasing, right? And, and that is, for example, something we've seen in other places who tried to replicate it. We have a great conceptual framework, an amazing law, but then there is no banks to work with, right? So what are you going to do? Uh, or they don't have critical mass of talent, right? If you have an amazing uh, place, great law, uh, even money uh, to throw at things, but if there is no people there and you can't get them there and they don't want to be there, you know, what are you going to do on Coconut Island, right? So um, other than going on holiday, so that's the other element, I'm not trying to slander anybody, right? But I think you know who I'm referring to. And, uh, and, and the third element uh, is obviously research, talent, uh, universities, yes, are critical and money. Let's face it, to build things, you need money. Now, a lot of those things are not tied to one place. So if we mm -hmm. want to make this significant, we need to scale it up globally. We need to bring those pieces together. Do, do you have any idea of, of how we could do that? I mean, just talking about how great things are here, and uh, we can also talk about the things that are not so great. That's that's one thing, but that's not going to move the dial too much, right? No, I think those are really, really important points. Switzerland is, and Crypto Valley is compelling, not because it's isolated, but because it's interconnected. And what we have to do, and what I think we're doing a good job, of is connecting with the other hubs of the world. Um, whether it's finance hubs like Singapore, which are also you know, really a hub in Asia for uh, where a lot of the regulations and uh, blockchain companies in Asia have largely conglomerated, uh, first in Hong Kong, and then for many reasons moved to Singapore. Um, you know, they've won that network effect. And so having access to that capital, because Singapore has a great uh, financial base, but they don't have as much of the research or the engineering base that you see in uh, Zurich and Switzerland. So I, I've, I've kind of boiled it down to, you know, we, we also need to tap into large existing network effects in Silicon Valley, in Austin, in Seattle, in these tech in the US, take those entrepreneurs and the ideas and companies put them in the world's best jurisdiction, where to your point, it's the continuity and the reliability of the regulations that is key, right? It, it's not that they were the most lenient, you can find more lenient places in the world, it's that they were stable, that it wouldn't change six months from now, they'd be able to build a real business and the rug wouldn't be pulled out from under them. But that's, that's the key. So. I think if we can connect into the large Asian capital markets, we can connect 
into the talent pools and the companies that have already been built as part of Internet 1.0 in North America, we can win this new network effect going forward because ultimately this is where they have to have the headquarters, which that's where they need their CTO, which that's where they need their engineering group. That's where they need to build their intellectual property. More and more of the laws are focusing in on real substance. And what this is doing is it's a huge benefit for Switzerland and, and Crypto Valley because many of the other jurisdictions that have loose, looser laws, the ones you're referring to, they don't have the ability to build real substance. You can't get people to move there. And if you can get them to move there, you can't really get them to stay, right? Because they're just too small. What I think is amazing about Crypto Valley is it's big enough, right? There are 3 million people in the greater Zurich area, right? There's, there's a country of 8 million people. There's enough engineers. There's enough actual um, scale in order to make it work, right? And so I think having the combination of being the friendliest jurisdiction and enough scale to make this uh, work is really the key. And so it's interconnecting with those other places. I was happy to see uh, Crypto Valley VC working with Dubai. And we should be working with Singapore. And we should be working with Silicon Valley because we can pull in those network effects. I mean, the fact that Facebook has to come to Switzerland is effectively the perfect proof that it doesn't matter how powerful you are, this is the friendliest place and the most stable place to do this, regardless of, of where you're coming from. So I think we're going to see a huge influx of people like myself who are committed to this industry and really want to be a part of it. And this is where you have to be. So no, I, I totally agree. There's interconnection is the key. Fred, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, awesome. I mean, from my point of view, I think what you're saying is, is really right and it's really okay. But I also think there are some, some, some cracks in Crypto Valley, right? For me, it doesn't seem like that the community is getting the network effects out of Crypto Valley what they should. So I see a lot of the companies is not working as actively together and sharing as we could have, have thought they would do in a decentralized finance uh, matter, right? I see a lot of competition. So do you see any, you know, do you see the same pattern? And how do you see that, if, for instance, in Wyoming? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, there definitely is, and I think the key word that you used is competition among companies. Um, whereas the protocols, because they're open source, have much more ability to collaborate. You know, I think the, especially the community around Ethereum has been extremely collaborative because there's no barrier, there's no intellectual property to protect. It's all open source anyway. By all means, use the code, fork the code, build on the code. You're not trying to protect something. And I think that's a fundamental uh, shift. And, and you know, I, I think even Silicon Valley has sort of gotten into this, this trap the last five years or so where it's more competitive than it is collaborative, right? Because of the way that the US uh, market has developed is it's become ever harder to IPO. And so companies are waiting later and later and later. You have to be $20 billion you know, company to really make sense to, to IPO. And so either they're protecting all their IP so they can get acquired by a larger company, right? Or they're, they're trying to build the, those moats um, so that they can they can get to that escape velocity, but either way, I think it develops some toxicity over time, and we haven't really seen a lot come out of crypto uh, out of Silicon Valley in this latest wave. Right, and it's still you know sort of better photo apps and and stuff like that. It's it's not taking on these these core challenges because in in blockchain it's all open source. And so I find much more collaboration in ecosystems like Austin. I do find a lot of collaboration in, in Crypto Valley, but it's among the protocols. It's among the DAOs. It's among the DAOs. And so I'm not even coming to Crypto Valley to build companies. I'm coming to Crypto Valley to build protocols and DAOs and DAOs and decentralized structures because ultimately, I think they're going to outcompete all the traditional companies. Any company has to have a profit margin. As soon as you have a user-owned network, you remove that need for profit margin. It's a direct relationship between the people creating the value and the people using the software, right? And so that's the thing we, we want to emphasize is 
we're not just going to create you know Silicon Valley 2.0. It's going to be something different, and it's going to be built on on different rails. So if you look at where most of the value is created. So far, it's largely been in the protocols and blockchain, uh, almost 10 to 1 in the value creation. So I think that will continue to, to be the case going forward. The first project you know, worth $100 billion is probably going to be a DAP or a protocol and not uh, a company, in my opinion. I think you touched on a very important point, and that's the one of culture. I mean, we are all children of, of the Silicon dream, right? And, and I think it was the American philosophers, Red or Chili Peppers, who said the sun may rise in the east, but at least it settles in a final location. And we've been, <laughs> been sold on this dream of Californication. But um, I think what all of those amazing companies in the Silicon Valley have together is centralization that's in their DNA. And I think that's what they're struggling with, and that's what they need to, to overcome. Now, yeah. we talk a lot about it, but we don't quite see it. You, you made an excellent point with uh, what's going on and being built uh, on, on Ethereum. And I think the same is true for, for our friends in Tezos and, and Cardano and others uh, places here in Switzerland and, and many, many other uh, exciting protocols. Um, and then there is the, like the key, the core believers group who kind of uh, abide by that, by that credo. Uh, but I think we still lack to bring that spirit out of the original uh, believers group. That would be us guys, right? Uh, and really to bring that kind of uh, new way of doing things uh, further up. It has to do with... Um, changing incentives uh, beyond just the applause on, on your Reddit and your Medium and, and your GitHub uh, and then kind of the, um, you know, uh, posterity that will uh, see you as the great person you are. Uh, I think that that's probably not quite there. Why it has worked in Switzerland, I believe, is because we have, you know, as I like to say, decentralization or DNA and consensus building that's part of the fabric, if you like. But it's not what we should confuse as the global standard. So to really show the benefits, to move people there, uh, I think more examples are needed. And that has a lot to do uh, with sharing the benefits, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of what you said earlier about the banks and institutions being willing to be part of this transition is the key. Um, in a lot of jurisdictions, they said, oh, we'll have friendly laws, but the rest of the business community wasn't ready, uh, to participate. But I've seen many very encouraging signs that, Swiss banks, you know, are willing to custody. They're willing to offer bank accounts. They're they're going deeper. They're building uh, subsidiaries like, of Swisscom that are heavily involved in in blockchain. Um, I'm glad to see uh, VI Partners, right, who has ten of the top corporates in Switzerland invest in Smart Valor, right? They're taking active investments now in in the industry, right, and they're not just sitting on the sidelines, you know. And that's that's what I think is important is Switzerland is in this unique place where it's embracing this technology as a strategic advantage compared to other financial centers. And I'll tell you, they're not doing that in New York. New York is so far behind in, in blockchain because they passed those very, very um, detrimental regulations early on with the bit license and effectively as a startup, you couldn't operate there. And so everybody had to leave, right? And there's now been this dearth of, of sort of fundamental innovation uh, there for, for years, and it all largely went through Switzerland. Um, and so I think that's, that's the key, is, is we're going to see sort of more of that and uh, that continue growing in the future. May, may, if I may um, ask a question here to that point. I mean, we have now two dreams that could happen, right? I mean... Going back now also to coronavirus, because I think that's also a topic that we should consider if we talk about ecosystems and how we can build that. So on the one side, you could say digitalization uh, and the, the, the building of the ecosystem is like forced through that because people are forced to work with that now. And on the other side, you can say, well, uh, people are thinking about doing investments or not. So they're saying like, well, we don't know if we go in this way. So how do you see the, the potential of that now? Um, helping building an ecosystem. So is it more like now a push that people say, okay, now we go in that direction or that people say, no, 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 we, we wait to invest and let's see what's happening. This is a great question. Um, because I think this is honestly the, the opportunity that the crypto industry has been built for, for the last 10 years is we've been building for a world where when the traditional financial system is 
going into inflation, when it's debasing its monetary policy, when it's having trouble operating, that people have an alternative. People have a way of receiving money through crypto. People have a way of you know, getting interest in return in the form of staking or DeFi apps when the banks stop paying interest, when treasuries are below 1%. I mean, it's a truly incredible time to think that sort of banks and finance have given up these core functions that they used to have, right? And now the space is there where people need an alternative and they need it today. And with people yep. going to remote and digital working, this is what crypto was built for. I wouldn't be surprised to see if we witness double or triple the user base coming out of this as we went into it, right? There are 50 or 100 million people that have digital wallets and access to crypto today. I think that's really going to quickly grow. And we're seeing that in every category. Right, online education, kids can do it. All of a sudden, these online education apps have massively grown. Right, in in the even the last few weeks, my, my daughter uses a, a little app called ABC Mouse. Right, she's four, and you know, teaches her numbers and letters and all these things. The service went down for two days. So many people were switching their kids onto these learning apps because they had no alternative, and that's I think what we're going to see here. 90% of Fed wires are done manually. What's going to happen to the wire system if people aren't there to operate the wires? There's a reason that the US literally yesterday just included, oh, we need digital dollars and we need the banks to have digital dollars in the legislation because they just had that eureka moment that we're like, uh-oh. Uh, this isn't going to work if there's nobody to process those wires, right? I don't know. Will wires take a week? Will they take three weeks? What, what's a 90% reduction in capacity look like for the financial system? The ATMs are out of cash in the U.S. The banks are closing branches. Chase has closed over 2,000 branches across the U.S. I don't think they'll reopen Banking in person was already on the decline and we just accelerated it by, let's say, five years, what was already actually going to happen. So everybody has to download the app. Everybody has to go through the friction that they were putting off. So for crypto, I think this is an incredible time for us to leverage what our industry is great at and give those tools to people when they need them the most right now, when they're working from home, when everything is going digital, you need to be able to receive a paycheck. They have an option, right? And so I started doing daily videos about educational uh, topics in crypto, largely because I think we're going to see, we're, we're even seeing a flood of people coming in and uh, want this technology today. So I think for us uh, in crypto, we have a big play, part to play and probably one of the most important parts because the, I, I am hopeful that, you know, the hospitals and the medicine will, will keep pace. This is going to be a long and, and difficult process. Um, but the effect, uh, there will be a large economic effect. And we have systems that can speak to a lot of those economic effects, uh, especially from the work from home, especially from the remote and digitization. So I think, honestly, this is something we can step up as an industry and really be part of the solution. So, so could I just take you back like one step here, right? So I know you're a big believer in Bitcoin. And when you speak about crypto, very often you're not speaking about the thousands of cryptocurrencies out there. You speak about a, a couple of few very decentralized cryptocurrencies, right? But you also mentioned the stimulus bill, right, which was uh, passed by the House of Democrats, right, which is some, suddenly mentioning, you know, we might have a, a governmental digital dollar, right? So what I would like to ask you is, you see now we have three different ecosystems. We have uh, Facebook with Calibra and, uh, in essence, Libra, as you mentioned before, which is now in Switzerland. Then you have uh, now some new digital dollar who seems to be coming really heavily based on the, the COVID-19 crisis, right? And then you have the Bitcoin. And I think those three are very, very isolated, different ecosystems. And they somehow, I mean, are they going to compete? Are they going to be, you know, living simultaneously? I mean, they have very different distribution mechanisms as well, very different adoption grades. So how do you see this war of crypto panning out? I don't think there's any war. Um, Libra has largely been, it seems like they will have 
Libra dollars and Libra euros and adopt the national monetary policy for the users that are in those jurisdictions. At least that's the latest uh, that they've been saying. So the concept of building a new monetary policy with the basket, which I thought was very compelling, it seems to be reduced and it's going to be more of a payment rail. The digital dollar will still be exposed to the same amount of inflation as the normal dollars, right? <laughs> it's just a different means of, of, of sending and receiving. And so to me, it seems like the competition has been cleared from the board. There's only one game in town, and it's these top decentralized cryptocurrencies. I don't think it's just Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin Cash and Dash and others are going after serious approaches to electronic money and merchant adoption. Bitcoin is, is very much going for the uh, store of value, the you know digital gold. And then you have you know other projects that are going after other uh, use cases. You know Ethereum is you know money for smart contracts, money for uh, DeFi, right? So I think there there are good projects in that top ten. You know you talked about Tezos. We've talked about a, a number of these, and we've had previous discussions about you know stable coins and how do you decentralize stable coins. You know so Pegnet and everything that's being built there with Oracle and consensus based stable coins. So I think you know. Largely, the way that the regulations have played out have removed real competition for monetary policy. And if the dollar gets debased by 50% and the price of everything goes up, it's not sending it slightly faster than it is the thing I want. It's the ability to opt out of the monetary policy. So this is what I did in 2012, right? Being an economic nerd, I didn't want exposure to dollar inflation, especially coming out of the 2009 crisis. And so I converted my money into crypto. And I'm very happy I did. And there's been lots of volatility along the way, but we've gone from $10 to $6,000 over eight years, you know, in the case of, of Bitcoin, you know, over a long period of time, I've been insulated from a lot of that inflation. I think that's the, the core value going forward is how do you opt into a different monetary policy? May I yeah, but just... Fred, just a second. I'm um, also for our audience that is looking now the live stream here. I repeat, it's also you have also the possibility to ask questions here. So just type it in on Facebook, and if there is a question, we we will then uh, well forward it to to David. Sorry, Fred, your turn. Yeah, I was just about to say, you know, that I think you know what everybody is always talking to me about that cryptocurrencies is uh, cannot be used because of volatility, and you've been mentioning volatility a couple of times, right? But I think what we just saw the last couple of days is that the Dow closes for the second time in history, right? I mean, that's like a, a historic event, right? And yeah. it really makes the cryptocurrencies volume look like a rounding error uh, when we think about the market sizes here, right? Um, but I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, when we look at Bitcoin and the adoption of Bitcoin and we look at some kind of a centralized, you know, stable coin, the mechanism is very, very different between these so-called stable coins, which is like an improved version of, of the money we have today and, and Bitcoin, right? I mean, for me, it seems to be two totally different worlds. Could you, you know, how do you see that? Well, I think stable coins largely as an on-ramp into digital currency. So it's, it's not a mistake that people want the unit of account that they're used to, right? They want the thing that, they owe bills in, that they owe salaries in, that they get paid in. Um, so it makes sense that people would adopt Bitcoin because they still think in dollars and euros or other things like that. But it quickly becomes this gateway into getting Ethereum and Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and these other uh, tokens because they, they start to see the benefits. And once they're in the crypto universe, they, they don't want to leave, right? The, the speed of the old financial network, it would be like going back to the post office after you discovered email, like you're not likely to go back, right? And email, if you think of that analogy, you know, gave people the idea that they should have instant communication, right? And then you have chat apps and then you have all the evolution of communication that we've seen. And so I think of it as an on-ramp. And honestly, I wish Libra well. I, I, I believe it could be the largest on-ramp to digital our currency the world has ever seen because it will give people access to a wallet for a time and then it's a very short hop to exchanges or switching into anything else and if you have a 
a DeFi project or a staking project that says, oh, here's a 7% annual return. And they look at their bank account and they say, I'm making a tenth of 1%. I'm going to take my, my stable coins and turn them into you know, Ether or whatever I need in order to get that return, right? And that's what we're seeing. I was just talking to a friend this morning that had done that. And he said, I'm not getting paid anything by the bank. I might as well put it in these DeFi apps. And so I think we'll see more and more of that. So I think that's, that's all fine. It, it's not real competition to the features of the decentralized protocols. It's just a means of getting in. And there are fully decentralized stable coins. There are groups that are using collateral in the case of, of Maker and DAI. And we've seen the challenges with that when the price of ETH went down recently. And which is why I've been advocating the last uh, six or seven months for Oracle or consensus-based stablecoins, which have no custodian, and there is no reserve or collateral, and there is no foundation, there's no counterparty. And so there are a wave of fully decentralized stablecoins that will allow people to value in whatever they want. Pegged gold, dollars, pegged euros, but also pegged Ethereum or pegged Bitcoin. Once once you have access to those kind of tools, you know, things are going to keep iterating. What I've, what I've been amazed at is this community continues to innovate every time it finds a challenge. Oh, centralized oracles were a problem? Great. Here's decentralized oracles to solve that. And it, with every time it hits a barrier, it becomes stronger. Yeah, I, I, I kind of get that, right? But for me, you know, Bitcoin is very much a store of value. And when you look at the stable coins, which is kind of a delta one product, as we call it in banking, right? So one token, one dollar, right? I mean, I just don't really see it, except if you are Libra and you have a distribution to three billion people, or maybe if you're the US government and can, you know, can have that kind of reach, right? And then when we go into these so-called a little bit more interesting finance experiments, like MakerDAO, as you mentioned before, right? I mean, they've been saying for years, you know, what is, why, why do we need central bankers, right? I mean, what are they really doing? I mean, see this, we can build all of that. And then we see just a little spike in volatility. And then they have to kind of, you know, take the handbrake, like totally. And I think that's healthy, right? Because now they innovate, right? Now they're, they're finally going to see, oh, maybe there is a next version of the system who's going to be really good. Huh? But for me, it seems like there's different ecosystems who's kind of, you know, sometimes collaborating, sometimes they're showing a little bit of dirt. And I think we have, it's too much dirt fighting and not enough collaborative innovation we're seeing in the ecosystems. I see, to, to be frank, I see a little bit too much hate, you know. There's the decentralized guys, we hate the bankers. The banker says, oh, we go towards like a quarter R3 because we can control it. It's nothing to do with blockchain, right? But then we kind of optimize just 1% and make our shareholders happy. So I, I'm kind of looking at, you know, how, how can we get the world to really embrace, you know, what cryptocurrencies and DLT really could mean in terms of inflation security, in terms of really, you know, not, I wouldn't say banking, the unbanked is kind of getting a, a wrong term, right? But I see there's a lot of businesses out there who really need help and they need data points and the government need trust that they can actually give good helicopter money, right? So how do we actually start creating that kind of scale effects? Sure. No, I think that's a great point. And I would like to see less tribalism in our industry, especially. I think people get into this mode that there's one token that will solve all the problems. And we don't see that anywhere else in technology. You know, I mean, occasionally you meet a programmer who says, no, this is the one programming language that will be the only programming language. But for the most part, people are pretty practical. You know, this programming language is good for websites. This one is good for databases. This one is good for building exchanges. They've all specialized. And I expect to see the same thing in crypto is specialization based on the industry, uh, based on the use case, based on and what it needs, right? And so to, to your point, um, there's been a lot of great work, let's say by Bit, for example, in the Caribbean to get the central banks there onto crypto and blockchain rails. There's the work uh, that's been done, you know, in, in Singapore and Switzerland and other jurisdictions in China, where they're adopting blockchain as a means of, of moving capital. And like you said, it will help them do more efficient distributions. You know, at the end of the day, it's a tool that can be used by, by governments and others also. Um, but, but I think it is important to sort of draw a distinction. It depends on, on what you want to accomplish. And like you said, store value is, is something that's really key. And, you know, 
if you want people to opt out of uh, government-based money, and you can see all the, the currencies behind me, I've got the 100 collapsed uh, currencies uh, from governments the last 30 years uh, behind me, as well as Mises and Hayek and the, the famous economists, right? And um, government, you know, their, their record's not so great. About 25 years on average for a fiat currency. I mean, Belarus has had three currencies since the fall of the law, right? And so, yes, we can help in distribution and states are going to use this technology, but ultimately I want people to be able to opt out a state policy because many of the people in the world are trapped in a, in a country where there's a very high inflation rate and a very bad uh, monetary policy. And so I think the best thing you could do is create competition. And the states aren't used to competition for monetary policy, uh, at least at this level. And I think we're it's going to actually improve the state currencies because, because for the first time, they will have to think of, oh, well, we'll lose users if inflation is too high, for example. We'll, we'll see how it plays out, but it's going to be interesting. Maybe, yeah, but I th think with the COVID-19 crisis right now, we're going to see a very special thing coming out, like nearly a war economy, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the monetary policy is going to kind of, you know, we're bleeding, you know, the arm is chopped off, right? Uh, the blood is spraying, right? The monetary policy will allow us to keep, you know, the enough blood in the body to kind of operate, but it won't heal our arm, right? That's where fiscal policy is coming in, right? That has to kind of, you know, repair us and basically get the, us into, a, let's say, solving the virus economy uh, distraction, which is coming, right? And with fiscal yeah. policy, one of the largest problems the government's actually sitting on is, you know, how do we give money to the right people, specifically the, 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 the Joes who's having, you know, a coffee shop or who's having, you know, a, a, like a lumberjack, you know, these one person, two person, three person companies, right? which is actually very much driving most of the economies around the world. And I see very few projects actually is going in and actually start thinking about how do we get data points from, from them, create an ecosystem around that, whether there is a, some kind of a small ERP system on blockchain, which then can be hooked in to not just how the government spend helicopter money, but also how, you know, the NGOs actually is, is, is securing that they get the money out there. I think there's a big part of the trust equation where we haven't started touching it in the ecosystems at all. Mm -hmm. No, that's I mean, a great point. Maybe yeah. can, can I also just add something, sorry, David, to that also on top, because I think it goes in the same direction. So we have Micah Button here um, listening to, to the conversation, and he's also like asking, David, can you please share your perspective on cryptocurrencies and tokens? And that goes more or less also in that what Fred is saying, why would I need 100 plus cryptocurrencies or tokens as a means of payment? If one synthetic asset um, as Bitcoin would be sufficient, for, uh, he, he writes, for example, it is known that proof of stake models are not profitable for stakers right now, given the volatility and the lack of network usage. So I think, Fred, if I if I may say, that goes also in like your like question, your comment. If you could ask, uh, answer that question from my Mika. Sure, uh, happy to address that. This is a question I've gotten since 2013. Um, and they used to call them app chains uh, long before uh, sort of the, the wave of Ethereum and everything else came out. And what you run into is yes, you can use things as a payment rail, uh, but no, you can't support another project with Bitcoin, right? Because that project doesn't have any ability to reward uh, miners, for example, with Bitcoin, right? Uh, only the Bitcoin protocol rewards Bitcoin miners. So if you have any other proof of work, whether it's the proof of work for Ethereum, uh, proof of work that decentralizes oracles on Pegnet, you have to have a native means in each blockchain to reward those behaviors. And there's no way to just pay them in Bitcoin without having now a central wallet some Bitcoin that somebody is handing out. And now you're back to a central party being in the middle of the transaction. So if you want decentralization, you have to have tokens. And I, I get it. Many of them will fail. Many of them are small experiments. Many of them are uh, don't have the network effect. But that doesn't change the fact that you need that mechanism in order to bootstrap uh, these decentralized behaviors. This was the single singular you know genius of Satoshi is that the software paid for the hardware 
the software had its own wallet and its own unit of account and could pay people to do the mining and secure the network. Everybody else that tried before, it was always a company or somebody holding the wallet. And as soon as that company came under pressure or the wallet was hacked, it proved very fragile and the system fell apart. All the predecessors to Bitcoin failed. The thing that made it successful is the network could pay for the behaviors it needed, right? This is the model that I described in the general theory of decentralized applications, the DAPS paper in 2013. This is why we need tokens for each of these protocols because you have to be able to do that innovation, which is hand the software a wallet and let it pay for what it needs. And you have to do that in the native tokens of, of the protocol. So, you know, it's a question that will always come up, but it's, it's really fundamentally important. I mean, Fred, is that going in like that, that direction that you had also your questions, how to like also uh, well, improve the ecosystem usability then of, well, of, of like uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain? Uh, not, not really, but, uh, but I mean, we can go on from this one, right? Because yeah, I think it's, yeah. a big, it's a big pain point right now that 70% of every retail person is basically banking with a non-bank, right? So because somebody has a great UX or UI experience, you know, you, you, you send your credit card uh, to somewhere in the Caribbean or wherever they are, right? And they basically hold your private keys and people are really not educated enough to actually understand what that means. And then we can speak about, yeah, the banks is not really facilitating this yet. But the fact of the matter is the 70% of the retail people that sit with a, it feels like a bank, it looks like a bank, it maybe, maybe act like a bank, but it doesn't have any kind of protection, right? And then we see all these hacks. Huh? But I think where my question was more going towards is I think sometimes we're trying to solve the wrong problems. I think there is a lot of things out there which, you know, which need solving, huh? And I think that needs the combined brain power of all of the entrepreneurs. And it needs that we need to lower the interest barriers for people to start understanding how do we solve those problems, right? And for to get there, I think first of all, people need to understand what is the problems. They need to be somehow incentivized to solve them. And I think that's what, what David is saying, right? With the stake pools and the treasuries, and can is there somehow a way we can we can give people money to solve important problems? And the other part is that they kind of need to be some kind of an acceptance around them, right? There need to be, you know, um, if it's big things, it's suddenly it has governments involved, it has maybe banks or national banks, uh, mm -hmm. reinsurance companies. And these kind of institutions, they just don't like to work with 10 people in the basement. You know, they, they want to work with somebody where it's, you know, where they can, you know, there is a counterparty risk, there is a branding risk, there is, you know, some kind of a layer of trust there who needs to be there. And I think that's what Crypto Valley and also Wyoming is doing really smart at the moment, right? Because you know that you know when people are incorporated in one of those jurisdictions, a lot of us are like PwC. We feel, all right, that works. We understand that. But when they then come with you know uh, San Kitts or, or some other jurisdiction like that, we're all like, yeah, but why? And I think there's a, a difference between legal shopping here and actually, you know, what is the incentives and what are we trying to solve? And what I would like to, uh, to get to from David is, you know, there are some very big questions right now with the COVID-19, basically, is, is, is somehow is showing the lacks or the failures of our uh, monetary and fiscal systems, right? And I think yeah. it would be very interesting to well, start kind of One addressing. of the simplest is you have to touch. Go ahead. Uh, no, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, happy to address that. I mean, specifically when it comes to the virus, you know, the fact that you still have to touch something in order to do the payment is a huge problem, right? The 100 people before you swiped a card or inserted the chip, and it's in a real attack vector, right? And so getting the contactless payments, you know, there's some of that. I know it's probably further along in Europe. There's some of that in the U.S., but really being able to do payments from your phone as opposed to using a physical medium is like one of these, these fundamentals. Um, I think back to like the, the plagues and, and uh, issues and sicknesses of the past. And this is part of what drove, let's say the city of London to build their first sewers was to address the sanitation and disease that was caused by lack of sanitation, right? And they would have never exceeded the size of the city without that basic infrastructure. Right, and now as a global society with almost 8 billion people, we're running into new problems. Fast spreading diseases, they're 
you know, coming in from every edge of the world, and we're more ever interconnected than ever with uh, transportation and 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 uh, flights and moving around quickly. And in order to not give that up, because I don't think we're going back to a time where there aren't airplanes, right? That is a, a modern convenience that we are very addicted to, right? For for the purposes of, of travel. And so, what do we need to do in order to reduce the attack factor so that we don't have to shut off? Like people used to literally leave the cities during the summer, right? It, you didn't want to get typhoid. You left during the summer. You went to you know if you had the money and the means, you you left the city and then you came back, right? Um, that feels like where we're at right now. We're shutting down the world economy because we do not have effective means of, of distancing or, or quickly enough uh, transitioning when something like this happens. So I think peer-to-peer -peer payments, I think having the option of remote work, and let's imagine this happened five years from now. And something is spreading and there's, there's no way to control it or stop it. We should react much faster next time but you have to have the infrastructure in place to react and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try to tamp this down, everybody do a week from home. And you know, do you have the tool? Because right now it's very painful because people don't have the tools to do that. But if you have the tools to do that, you could imagine a scenario in which people can react much faster. I mean, you can even think about a global trusted infrastructure, right? I mean, because I think one of the, one of the reasons we don't have the tools is because we simply don't trust the providers, right? And I think that's where crypto or DLT could actually come in if we could actually start trusting other countries without actually having to have an opinion about the political state and other things, right? So I think there's a whole foundational level around what we've been building in crypto, which we haven't started employing yet, right? And obviously, there's been some problems around, you know, scalability and, and other things. But the next generation of, of crypto or DLT infrastructure must start addressing these big infrastructure problems which we see among the countries and the defragmentation we see of the nation states. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think maybe, David, sorry if I'm interrupting you. Um, we have here, and that, that goes again. I think you already answered just that question, Fred. We have from Philip Todd. Uh, he is asking, how can DLT support the needs of today hyper-localized trading for goods and services? Currently, the policy response to Corona. I mean, as I understand you, I don't know if we can respond to it because we don't have the infrastructure. What would you, your answer be? I mean, Fred or David also? Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, I mean, from, from my point of view, I think one of the first things we need to look at is how do we actually share uh, information among countries in a trusted manner? And if you kind of look at what DLT does and, and why Bitcoin actually works really well, not just in terms of the Byzantine uh, fault tolerance, but also in terms of of double spending and so on. It's just a very good unilateral reporting facility, right? It's the global ledger, right? And what I don't kind of understand is if, if we, you know, all the politicians from the different countries are looking at different numbers. And the first thing they're saying is, can I trust that number? Do, wh who actually put in that number? H how are they measuring things, right? Mm -hmm. So we're coming back to these kind of standards and that actually kind of guides them to take decisions. And I think a lot of decision is simply taken because they're saying, you know, I don't trust that country out of some political reason. And then there is so much focus on, on that kind of lack of trust. And I think we're sitting here with a technology which actually enables us to, to trust, um, you know, untrusted, uh, you know, institutions really, right? So I think we should start using that as an infrastructure component to share data around uh, like viruses and epidemics, right? But I think it goes far, far beyond that, uh, if I may add, because we talked a lot about crypto and, and that's all beautiful and obviously we are passionate and pay stuff back there uh, and that's all good and fine. But we, we obviously have big, big problems out there. We see that today. And as I said before, a lot of that has to do with uh, centralization and a lot of that has to do with linear models, right? And for, for decades, we've been told at university and everywhere uh, that we can't change that because it's all about efficiency and la 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 mm -hmm. and uh, it's just too complex to take those things apart and I believe that the blockchain as the as the infrastructure technology is enabling us to do exactly that right we we can start to not only work remote but also take the infrastructure apart literally and move away from those pyramids we have erected 
all those pyramid uh, infrastructure corporations and, and, and kind of value chains, because we can now start to interact on a trusted layer. We can, you know, as we do it right now, interact with somebody sitting in the Silicon Valley, somebody in Switzerland, somebody uh, anywhere in the world, right? And we don't need all of that shebang. Uh, anymore. And I think that's that's the bigger chance. And the second chance that comes with that, one of the reasons why we don't have the uh, uptake yet, I believe, and why we have to strive a little, because it's still all about Bitcoin or any kind of current, this old stuff that's linked to the financial services industry. Now, when I look at us, and Nicolo is kind of a bit of an outlier, we're not Gen Z, we're not millennials even, right? So this new generation coming up is really passionate about solving the big issues out there. They're really about values, about sustainability and all those kind of things. And they're not really interested in the monetary side of things. So if we subtract the pure payment and monetary and store of value, the feature of it, and look at the opportunity and, and the potential of the technology to really start to address those big uh, issues, I think this is when we can build really global infrastructures, global communities uh, to, to take that up and indeed global ecosystems. Yeah. My question to me would be, do you see that? Is there a chance? Can we move beyond just the money uh, part of, of cryptocurrency and, and uh, in blockchain? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen great protocols like Falcon uh, working with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on health records um, for the last few years, uh, working with DHS on identity uh, and solving some of those problems. So there's a lot of work that has been done. Um, and it, what, what was the first pronunciation by the Department of Homeland Security, blockchain managers related to supply chain are now critical infrastructure, right? That was one of the things that came out just a few days ago because they're, oh, it would be really helpful if we had medicine, food, all these things, probably like you're saying, how can you trust the data, right? And that's what blockchains are great at, is it breaking down these walls where before you could only trust your own database if you could trust your own database, like who put it in? I don't know, there's a database admin, right? Um, and so having instead where everybody has a digital identity, everybody has digital signatures, this is one of the things I think can come out of this crisis. Let's look at the crisis in, in 2001 with 9-11. One of the biggest laws that came out of that was the UIDA Digital Signature Act because so much of the signatures were still being done physically, and that was all disrupted when New York was shut down, the federal government said, no, 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 we have to have digital signatures be recognized, the same as physical signatures, or we're not gonna be able to solve this. And so all the states in the early 2000s passed these laws that recognized digital signatures at the same level as physical signatures. And that was, you know, now we look back at that as an obvious or simple thing, but we need the thing in all of these records. That has to be, the DLT record should be the highest form of authentication. It should be the original form of authentication. I know Switzerland right now is working on legislation around securities and everything, not needing to have a, a paper backup, but the actual ownership, true ownership and proof can be in blockchain. So I think that's a similar moment that we're at right now is you know, let's let's move fully into the, using these capabilities. That that's I think something that can emerge very quickly. Good. So we have uh, I have to we could I think continue this conversation for the next forty five minutes, one hour. So we have one minute left. Uh, I would say we have one or two questions that we we can uh, ask David, and then afterwards I'm sure that uh, if there are more questions, uh, we can also. Like have maybe another intercession with you in, in some months, but I would just ask Günther and uh, Fred. Um, now we have just a question <laughs> uh, coming in, but just uh, Fred or Günther, do you have uh, one last question? I mean, we can do both one question and then afterwards a question from Yai Kubert to, to close it. So I just uh, want to ask you, Fred or Günther, um, do you have a question? close then uh, the, the conversation afterwards? I think my last question will be around the ecosystems one more time. I think what we're seeing right now is we are centralizing entrepreneurship and innovation into people who has a lot of money. Mm. How do we push power more to the edges of the system and democratize uh, innovation and entrepreneurship around blockchain and uh, protocols? You change the monetization. Today, the way an entrepreneur makes money is to get largely bought by a larger company. 99 out of 
100 startups, they don't get to IPO. They get acquired. So if, you, if your only path to monetization and getting paid for all your years of hard work is to get acquired by a big central company, you will adopt the structure that they expect. You will have a Delaware core with exactly this form, and here's the stock options, and here's, here's the structure, right? What we did in 2014 with the DAP fund is just a small venture fund that I put together that had an all token thesis. And we said to people for the first time, we're only investing in tokens. Take your company somewhere else, but if you build a protocol or a token, we will invest in that. And you saw this explosion of entrepreneurs and small people who said, oh, I don't have to you know, go through the traditional route and, and all the headaches. I'll go, I'll go down that route, right? And Ethereum went down that route and all these guys went down that route after people said, there is money for this new model. Use this new model and we will invest in it. And we ended up with $20 billion flowing into token offerings and token sales. And it got way ahead of itself. Um, but a lot of good things were funded. A lot of good innovation came out of that. Cardano came out of those days. You know, um, many of the protocols that are, are now delivering, Hedera and Algorand and all these enterprise ones, all came out of that time. And so now we're seeing the fruits of all that capital that was invested in that new model. And I think we're at a similar point. I'm saying, and I want to send the signal, I'm investing in DeFi. I'm investing in dApps. Take your companies elsewhere. I'm investing in those structures. And there's a lot of people with me that are interested in those structures. We've gotten a taste of what liquidity and global scalability and this industry can deliver. And we want to do that. Again. So that's what I would say. You've got to change the incentives. Yeah. Um, Good. I would give you the last question. I would just switch to the question from, from the audience. And then afterwards, I will give you the final question. So, Jay Kubert is the sales director at Ledger Focus on EMEA. And here's the question. In the context of custody of digital assets, some firms have physical uh, dependencies requiring individuals to go to a bank to also access their funds. So how do you see uh, firms in your purview address physical dependencies like this? I don't know, is, is the question clear? Yeah, no, I, I think it makes sense. Um, we're just going to have to move to systems where people can do those physical dependencies from anywhere. Um, you know, bank vaults in general, I don't think is necessarily where you want to keep your keys. Uh, I think there's, there's uh, some points of failure there. If they come to the bank branch in an emergency, how do you, how do you get your keys? And so I think what we're going to see is alternatives to traditional bank vaults. Um, I've already seen private uh, vaults and other systems emerge and people are using them um, that won't be affected by these types of crisis in the future. That or, you know, this gentleman is asking from Ledger, people can hold their own keys. And having that Ledger is like having that vault, especially if you have a multi code where it's spread across many people, there isn't the physical security risk of one person having their Ledger stolen if you're doing this across three or four executives, you can build a lot of redundancy uh, into these systems. And then obviously having the backups is always smart, um, you know, and even splitting those up. So there's a lot that's being done in, in custody and making custody easier. That's going towards biometrics. In, in security, there's three things. Something you know, something you have, or something you are, right? Something you know is a password something you have as a device, something you are as your biometric. And things are moving away from let's make people memorize long passwords to having a device and having myself is much, much secure, more secure and can't be accessed remotely the way somebody could uh, steal a password, right? So I think that's the, the world we're headed towards and thank the guys at Ledger for all their work to, to push us in that direction. Perfect. <laughs> Good. May, so, maybe just a uh, dip into zero knowledge proofs as well, right? I think zero knowledge proof is definitely going to up up the game around that. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 100%. Pascal Gauthier has also been uh, at our conference, so 
yeah, we have there the link also. So, um, Günther, if you have a question, last question, uh, <laughs> it's uh, to you, please. Sure, last question, and who knows me knows what's coming. Uh, it's you know, it's all beautiful, but we can't ease or breathe, uh, eat or breathe our our money, digital or not. So the question is, how are we gonna use this amazing opportunity uh, to, to get a build a more sustainable future for all of us? Hmm. I think that's a great question. Um, well, one, if you can get remote work, it requires less production. It requires less cars and less other infrastructure and less uh, production in general. Um, so there are a lot of things that could have been remote for a while. And, you know, the, the joke I saw in one of the memes this week is a guy coming to the realization, oh, those meetings really could have been emails all these years. <laughs> and the guy, you know, is like, oh, well, I, I, could have, I really could have been doing this remotely. Um, and so there's a huge advantage in environmental and sustainable impact when it comes to uh, doing things virtually uh, versus in person. You know, people often more proof of work, but it uses a fraction, fraction of the energy that keeping all those packages and those millions of people, you know, sitting in air conditioned offices, you know, um, you know, it's 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 not even comparable, right? So uh, when it comes to sustainability, you know, remote and digital can play a big role. Um, we may see a lot more virtual conferences, right? And a consensus, the huge New York conference every year is going to be a virtual event uh, this year, right? And so I don't know if that's going to go away when COVID goes away, right? Because once we have the infrastructure, once we have the convenience, once we can scale, why can't consensus hold a million person conference? Today, they're limited to the size of the Javits Center or something, right? And they can fit their 10,000, 20,000 people. Why can't you have a million person event? You know, because today those physical infrastructures can't handle it. But I can imagine just like my daughter is using a learning app that millions of other people are using, she doesn't have to cram into a schoolroom with 30 other kids, right? So there are efficiencies, there are big benefits. Um, so we just have to look for where we can we can take benefit from this crazy situation. And, uh, you know, don't forget to be kind to one another and wash your hands and, and all that good stuff too. There's little things we can all do. <laughs> Perfect. So... Then uh, thank you very much for this more than an hour conversation here. Thank you, first of all, David, of course, for joining in and for taking the time. Thank you also, Gunther and Fred, also for, for being our strategic partners for long years and now to, to do this together here. Really appreciate it. And of course, thank you very much to all the people that have been uh, listening and seeing this live stream here. So we will, of course, having other live streams in the next months to come regarding also developments in the market and the industry in this format here. And we, we all try to, to, well, to look at live stream again in the next months to come. So thank you very much also to you, David, uh, Günther and Fred. Enjoy your evening and see you uh, next time again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great discussion. Thank you, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Good. So, thank you very much, guys. Uh, that was cool. That was really nice. Yeah.